What's up, Heralds, and welcome to the first of weekly, new weekly installments that Phantology will be doing covering the Rhythm of War chapters, pre-release chapters that Sanderson and Tor are putting out online. So they did this for Oathbringer as well, and it's going to happen for Rhythm of War, which is going to come out in under four months now. So we expect to see, I think, every week at least a couple chapters coming out. We got the prologue in Chapter 1 that came out on Thursday, and so I will be going through and dropping short episodes covering those chapters, and then we will compile them before the book comes out and and release them all as like the Part 1. I, I'm assuming this will be Part 1. That's, that's how they did uh, Oathbringer. It covered up to... Um, the, the showdown in Hero Theory. Um, and this will be full spoilers, so if you haven't read Oathbringer or any of the other books yet, probably not a good idea to listen. So the prologue, once again, uh, and this part of this chapter had already been released. Neither one of these are entirely new. I think all of chapter one had come out in, in an email from Sanderson's newsletter, and most of the prologue had been out before. So. The prologue is from Navani's perspective of the fateful night of Gavilar's assassination, as the first three books kind of did the same thing from different points of view. Now we get Navani, and Navani is in total queen mode here. She's running the show while Gavilar does who knows what with these mysterious people that have been showing up. I mean, we know a little bit, but Navani doesn't. So she's running the show. She has a few interactions here. Uh, she runs into her daughter-in-law. A Sudan, who we obviously saw in Kolinar and Oathbringer, uh, and part of the Revel, so we don't really think much of her, and this uh, view of her in the prologue does not do anything to help our opinion of her, because she's just very conceited and doesn't seem to care for this big-time ardent who Navani is super fascinated with, but isn't able to speak with because of all the duties she is trying to cover. She also interacts with, well, she... So after uh, talking to Asudan and kind of exploring around the palace, talking about what her her duties are, etc., she goes to talk to Gavilar, and this is the majority of the chapter, the majority of the interesting stuff. So first of all, Gavilar is a total jerk. I mean, we were getting hints that maybe he wasn't the greatest guy in the previous books, but this really cements that he's a total jerk to her, she says that this has been getting worse recently, and he's not necessarily always this man, but he belittles her and threatens her, and this is just a real bad look for Gavilar. So previously, we had been like, oh no, Gavilar died, the king. That was kind of what we had been led to believe in the first couple books, at least. But now I'm thinking, like, who cares? This guy's a jerk. I mean, it's interesting that he's discovering... Uh, more of the Cosmere here and, and getting into some pretty deep stuff, but mm, don't care for him, especially the way he treats Navani, who's awesome. So we do kind of wonder a few things here. He's talking with some heralds. These are obviously heralds. Nail is mentioned specifically. He's got the scar. This is 100% this is Nail. We think the other guy is a shorter guy. Uh, we think he is Kalik. And they mention that there's another one like them around, and so this is probably uh, Shalash, who we know has been like defacing paintings and takes her statue. So there's at least three. I mean, Ye Yezerin is there as well as a beggar, so I wonder if by the time we get all the information, maybe like all nine of them were there at, the, at this party. They talk about a box traveling back and forth from Braze. This is interesting. We don't really know what this means, but they're obviously pretty far along with their world hopping, and obviously the Heralds know about this, but Gavilar is very heavily involved here with the Heralds. Interesting. I mean, these are Heralds of the Almighty, and they have kind of taken Gavilar in as one of them. Question, is he a Knight's Radiant? Because for a second there's a scene where he kind of looks towards uh, nothing, I guess, and Navani doesn't know what he's talking or doesn't know what he's doing, and then he he snaps back to her. So is he seeing a spren? Is this mean that he has bonded uh, a spren? Could it be like a void spren? Because we think that Cavalier is totally evil, but he's also working with heralds. So interesting here. He's got all of these different spears uh, filled with 
like alternate light. This is probably void light. I don't think these are spears holding the unmade. They would have to be bigger or maybe a little more distinctive. And we know he gives one to Zeth, and we know he gives one to Ashani, and then by the time he's killed, he has none left, and so they've been taken from him at some point because he had a lot in the pouch originally. So what happened to the rest of the spears? We don't know. I guess maybe we'll find out. Um, we also get some rumors that Navani has been saying some things that have, that have caused rumors, and this probably references Dalinar. Dalinar's a total wreck at the time, but Navani loves him, and Gavilar and Navani kind of talk about this a little bit. Gavilar insults her about this, and I think it's interesting that she just still loves him, even though he's a total wreck and a drunk, but is she trying to help him get out of this? Not super clear. I mean, she does later on, but back in the day, mm, I, I want more here. And then by the end, when Gavilar is killed, we see Navani totally in charge, being a boss, being the queen. We like this. It seems like she is going to hold Colinar together at least a little bit until we get to present day action. So that's my take on the prologue. Rolling into chapter one, which I had read before from Brandon's newsletter, but uh, reading it again just today. So Liren doesn't really see a difference. This is from Liren's perspective, I should say, in Hearthstone. Liren is Kaladin's father. He doesn't really see a difference between the singers being the leaders and regular humans being the leaders and war is kind of war and you just kind of endure it and buckle down and do the best you can. And this is an interesting mindset, very different than the mindset of the Knights Radiant heroes that we've been seeing. And it makes sense, but at the same time, it's kind of like, ah, Liren, you're kind of a coward, man, a little bit. And that's what Kaladin struggles with, with his father. And I see what he's saying, but at the same time, it would be nice to, to see him fight back a little more, but he's also just a regular guy, and he's doing his best as, as a surgeon, trying to keep people safe, so admirable. I think maybe this behavior should be attracting some type of spren. Maybe we'll see that in the future, but no hints of that at all yet. So this is a year after Oathbringer. War has ravaged the land. Kolinar has pretty much fallen, uh, and, and so has the rest of Althkar. And now Herdaz, who has been, uh, I guess, fighting for a while against the Singers, kind of against all odds, they have fallen as well, and now there are a bunch of refugees making their way into Alethkar, and Liren is treating this line of refuge refugees amongst these refugees is a general from the Herdaz forces, and this guy is known as the Mink. Laurel, the daughter of... Uh, the daughter of the previous Sprite Lord, who is now married to Roshone. This is the girl that Cal, young Cal, has had a crush on in the flashbacks of Way of Kings, and she has now grown up a bit. She seems to be a pretty admirable woman, although it bugs me that she doesn't call Kaladin Kaladin when she talks to Lyrian. She calls him your son. It's like, come on, Laurel, you know Kaladin. He's your friend. Call him Kaladin. And by the way, he's also a hero, so can he get some props from these guys? Hmm, I don't really like the way Kaladin's being thought of here. So, uh, we get Kaladin at the end of the chapter, but not quite yet, because uh, because Liren helps the Mink and his people try to, uh, to, to get to safety a little bit. There's been drawings circulating of these undesirables, and so this is one of them. But before they get too far... They pause, and the, the current city lady, who is a Parshendi, now a singer, um, pauses as a fused, comes into the, the refugee camp, and this fused is basically a hulking monster. I kind of think of him as like the Parshman Hulk a little bit, is how he's described, and he comes in and he demands to look through the refugees for a supposed traitor or undesirable criminal, whatever you want to say. And he starts describing him, and it's obviously Kaladin, and Liren comes to this realization, and as they're pulling back hoods of people in the line of refugees, they flip one over, and there is our man, Kaladin, and this is pretty much how the chapter ends, as Kaladin starts to glow 
and we're about to see a throwdown in Chapter 2, hopefully, unless we switch viewpoints, which Sanderson does all the time. So eventually we look forward to this fight between Kaladin and the Parshendi Hulk, and that is my review of the first two chapters, the prologue and the in Chapter 1. And I just have to say, I was way excited to read these. I mean, I've read the majority of this already, but it got me right back into the action. I'm really, I'm really looking forward to future chapters and future weeks, and excited, be, so excited for Rhythm of War to come out in November. So let me know uh, what you guys thought of these chapters. Hopefully you enjoy these segments. Um, they'll be shorter, but I think by the end we'll compile them into something that uh, makes a little more sense in a longer review. So if you like Phantology Books, check us out at Phantology Books, www.phantologybooks.com. We have some exclusive content on our Patreon, and hop on our Discord, please, and discuss. We have a channel set aside for Rhythm of War hype, so let us know what your theories are. I'm going to try to come up with some theories and share them in these reviews, because that's one of the funnest things. I Because I really like these theories, kind of crackpot theories, whatever. I had this crazy theory going into Oathbringer that did not pan out at all, so I'm going to come up with a similar one for Rhythm of War, and who knows, maybe one day I will... I will guess what Brandon is planning for us, but I never have a to date. So thanks for listening. Ontology Books, see you later.